First of all, I want to thank Vocast because, I mean, they put on this great event for everyone. And let's just face it, we don't get a chance to all get together if you're in sales ops very often. So hats off to Vocast, I, I say, right? Let's give, them a good, let's give them a good round. We're going to talk today about the sales technology stack. And believe it or not, I don't think technology really matters a whole lot. I think what really matters is that you figure out what are the ways that are the different things that are causing friction and keeping you from selling. And when you figure that out, then you can figure out the technology that can help with that. Okay, but what I'm going to talk about today, first, a little bit of background. Um, I come from the sales world. I've sold for my entire career. I started in Silicon Valley, not far from here, actually. Um, it was for a, a, the world's first laptop computer manufacturer, known as Grid. And it was located on Garcia Avenue, which is where Google is now. And we were right across the street from another startup called Sun Micro. So I've been in sales for a long time. I've actually uh, sold for large, uh, sold two large enterprise accounts like Microsoft and Intel and HP. And about 10 years, 10 years ago, I decided that I needed to start my own company. So I did, and it was to track what's going on in the sales tech world. Now, what was going on in the sales tech world 10 years ago is very different than what's going on in the sales tech world today. Um, about a year ago, I had just launched a second company called Vendor Neutral, and Vendor Neutral is designed to help match the priorities that you have as an organization to the technologies that are available to meet those priorities. I want to start by talking about the paradox of choice. Did anybody read that book? You heard that book? Great book. And we always think that if you, the more choice you have, the better, right? We all want to be able to choose from a lot. But in reality, less or more can be less. So I'm going to talk about that and why and what that has to do with technology. But these are the things that I am seeing out in the sales tech world, OK? So for one, is this whole notion of the paradox of choice. We're up to 600 different sales technologies, 600. So as a sales ops provider or a practitioner, how are you supposed to make sense of all that? It's very difficult. You have your own job, by the way, as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I also am seeing that there's a huge proliferation of point solutions. As I mentioned, there's 600 of them. So how do you keep from having the shiny object syndrome? A lot of times what we do is we feel a pain. You know, either your house is on fire or the foundation's cracked and you kind of uh, prioritize based on what is the most painful. Well, that can be the shiny object syndrome. Because if you're just kind of going, oh, this is important, this is important, and this is important, and you know, kind of running back and forth, you're not really stepping back and looking at things from a strategic perspective. And that's what I really advocate for, is to try to stop Get out of the weeds a little bit, elevate yourself up, and think about it again from a strategic perspective. Because that's what technology can do for you, is give you a strategic advantage, but only if you look at it from a higher level. Okay? And one of the problems is that um, you know, not many companies have the, you know, can, can actually do that, because they don't have anybody who's in charge of it. And that's another problem, is who's in charge? So these are the things that I'm seeing, and I'm going to take you through. I do want to go back to that paradox of choice. Um, one of the studies that they mentioned in the book was called the JAM study. And some university uh, researchers went to a high-end grocery store, and they decided they would test this whole choice concept. So in one experiment, they offered 24 different JAMs. In another, they offered six JAMs. So would anybody like to guess at how many? or which, which experiment drove the most purchases? That's right, six. So although the 24 jams attracted more shoppers, right? because it's interesting, it's got, wow, look at all these jams. This only attracted 40, the, the uh, 24 attracted 60%. 30% of shoppers bought the jams if they were, they were only presented with six. 3% bought when they were presented with 24. So think about your own you know, industry and how many offerings and, and, and competition there is for choice 
in your own industry and think about how you can simplify. But when it comes to sales technology, this is what we're looking at here. And I would ask, how many of these companies are you talking to? Probably just a very small fraction of that. Um, so what I want to do today is help you figure out a way to make sense of this. How do we start? Where do we start? And I mentioned technology doesn't matter. So don't start with the technology, although the temptation is there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how you can identify the technology gaps that you have. But what I really want you to do after that is take a look at what are your capability gaps. And then you can ma match those capability gaps to the technology gaps. All right, so I want to just also talk about, before we move on, this, um, the fact that there's no really typical strategy or strategic view or no one person that's overseeing technology. We did a uh, LinkedIn job description analysis and we kind of did a word cloud. So this is looking at what people who hold this role say they do, the kinds of things they do. So in sales ops, probably a lot of this looks familiar to you. Right? So you have a lot to do. You have a lot in your plate. We heard that from the last panel. And then you also look at tools. And when we did the word cloud for sales enablement, these are the kinds of things that they do. They also have a lot on their plate. And then they also do a little bit of tools and technology. And then the last one we looked at was sales leadership. Again, a lot on their plate and a little bit of technology. So what happens when everybody you know, in different divisions or groups are looking at technology in just a little bit of a way? and usually isolated as well, or oftentimes isolated. So one of the first things that I would suggest to do is figure out who's going to be in charge, who's going to oversee all of this, and not leave it up to individual groups to kind of look a little bit, well, I need this, and I need that, and I need that. Here's the thing, though, that everybody has the same um, objectives, right? We, we saw all of those different solution providers. There's just as many problems to solve. So you have to figure out, how am I going to solve, or which problem should I solve first? Which are the important ones? And I think they come down into four areas. We want to sell more. We want to do it in less time. We want to do it at the right price. And we want to do it while we're lowering costs. Right? Those are really, it all comes down to that. Simple, right? <laughs> it's easy stuff. How do we sell more? And how do we do it faster? So if you think about that and you start to um, match the technology to the things that are going to help you with this, but more important that you think about uh, what are the things that we want to be able to say we can do? Are we able to do X? Are we able to do Y? What are the friction points that are keeping us from selling more or from doing it faster or from selling it at the right price? Those are the questions to take back and ask all the people that you work with. Right? What's keeping us from doing each one of these four things? And I'm going to give you a roadmap to use. Uh, when we talk to people about creating their own sales stack, we use a framework called the Stack Framework. Clever, right? Um, the S st stands for stakeholders. And then we have the technology. So you want to identify the technology that you already have in place, get a sense for what's helping you and what maybe isn't helping you as much. Then you want to audit your capabilities, understand what capabilities you have and which ones you're lacking. And then you want to compare the two. So if I'm lacking in certain capabilities, how does that line up to the technology that I have today? Maybe I have technology that can help me with that, but I'm not utilizing it for that. So that would be a good place to start. Maybe you don't have technology. Um, this is going to point out a lot of, uh, once you do that comparison, you're going to recognize that you often don't have the right technology in place, or you're not utilizing the technology that you do have well. And then the last one is to know what questions to ask yourself and to, and to ask vendors. Because often we go to vendors and we say, well, we know we need a CPQ solution. So um, therefore, you know, let's go down the feature list and let's figure out who has this feature, who has that feature. And those aren't really the right questions to ask. Neither is price. Because price really shouldn't matter. What matters is if you're going to get what you need to make a difference in the way you sell and how much you can grow your revenue. So you want to ask vendors questions that are going to get at that. And we're going to go through some of those questions as well. Okay. So um, let me get back to the, um, 
the stakeholders now, right? That's the first one, stakeholders. We talked about sales leaders, sales enablement, sales ops. Those three together really have the power to transform. But they have to be working together. Now, with the panel before us, it sounds like you guys are doing a great job all working together. Um, but it doesn't, you need more than just three, these three as well. You also need the organizations that are around you. You've got to be working with marketing ops. You've got to be working with demand gen, even infotech. There's security issues that need to be addressed. What does marketing already have that can help you on the sales side? Um, what do you need to have so that you can tie into that great data that marketing has to get the leads sooner, to make sure you can line leads up to the accounts in your CRM? Um, talk to inside sales, the, peop the people, the people that are actually selling. Talk to field sales, and then talk to sales leadership as well. Senior leadership, sorry. Right, the senior leadership, what is important to them. And then figure out when you're looking at, let's say, CPQ, I always tend to use that as an example. Um, you know, how does that have to tie into your finance, finance department? Um, how is it going to impact people? Who's going to have a say? All of these people are going to have great ideas that they can contribute that are going to help keep you from making a mistake on the technology decision. So um, there's a lot more that goes into the stakeholders, but I have 40 minutes, so I'm going to uh, move on from that. So let's talk about the technology. How do you identify the technology that you already have and understand whether or not it's doing the job for you? We have a, a matrix here, and this is a maturity matrix. On the left is a hierarchy, like Maslow's hierarchy. I'm going to spend a little bit of time taking you through that. And then across the right are the different belt levels. So that gives you a feel for what is your maturity level as an organization. Um, now, the pyramid, no, can you read that black? It's a little hard, isn't it? Um, the very bottom level, now on Maslow's, I'll just remind you that on Maslow's, the most important fundamental need is to stay alive. Because okay? nothing else matters if you can't stay alive. This, to me, the who to sell to and why, is the most important fundamental level. You know why? Because if you're not selling to the right people, and a lot of us are not, because we're just, we're just responding to leads. We think that because they downloaded something, it's, it indicates their interest and they're going to they're gonna want to buy something or they landed on our pricing page. But is that really the case? Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of questions you can ask yourself to understand how well you've mastered the who to sell to and why. Um, but I just want to, for now, give you a feel for what all of the different levels are. The next one after that is how do you get them to engage with you? Everyone you're selling to is getting dozens of sales calls every day. So how can you stand out and be different? How can your sales rep stand out and be different? How can you get their attention? Believe it or not, 98% of cold calls do not convert into an appointment. Okay. It takes 18 attempts to reach a buyer. 18 for one buyer. So what can you do to shorten that process? Uh, because that is impacting your ability to grow revenue. So once you understand who to sell to, how to get them to engage, the next level up is how do we communicate value in a way that they you know, accept. So I know I need to do something, and I know I need to buy something, and I know I need to buy it from you. That's that third level. Then, how are you going to get them to close? And for those of you who have, who have had a sales role, you understand that a lot can go wrong between the time you get a verbal and the time that you actually get a signed deal. People leave, uh, budgets get cut, re reorgs take place. So you, you, you want to be able to close as quickly as possible. And there are technologies for that and, and processes to help you do that. Um, now on the closing side, if you get all the way to closing, and you lose the deal, that's a whole lot of wasted capacity. Think about that. So while the who to sell to and why is extremely important, all these levels are important, just like they are in Maslow's. But this does tell you a way to prioritize. Because you don't want to be working the entire funnel selling to the wrong people. 
Now, Maslow's, you might remember, has the very top, the peak. What is the very top of Maslow's hierarchy? Anyone want to remember that? Self-actualization, self that's right. So the self-actualization in selling is selling again. <laughs> it's upselling, cross-selling, renewing. That's our self-actualization. That's what we want to get to. And a whole lot has to happen before then. So again, this is just a framework to think through all the different things that your sales reps need to be able to do and do well in order to grow revenue. Now, there's two things that are balancing on top. I've never figured out a way to represent this graphically. Um, so if anybody wants to help me with that, that would be great. Um, Maslow's had five levels, um, but there's two more. And these are not sales rep levels so much as they are management uh, levels, or as they are levels that trans you know, permeate throughout the entire pyramid. So you have how do we manage and how do we compensate? How do we motivate? And then you have how do you train and reinforce? So that's the whole skills development. Oftentimes that's the sales enablement function that looks into that. But those are other two other areas to look to to understand what you can do to have an impact on revenue. We heard a lot in this room about the top two. We heard less, we heard some, but less so on the sales side. Now it's because I would imagine, right, you've got ops, operations as part of what you do. But don't lose sight of this big pyramid here because that is what moves the needle. All right, now we can take a look at where you're at from a technology perspective by using this kind of bingo card, if you will. Now, if you have, you know, you're just doing face-to-face -face training. You have a kickoff once a year and you're doing face-to-face -face training. That's a white belt level. You're not taking, you, using technology. You're not, you know, scaling it in any way. You're not customizing it in any way. That's pretty much a white belt level. And for managing and forecasting, if you're using spreadsheets, that's a white belt level. So what we suggest people do is use some highlighters. You know, get yourself four different colors of highlighters. And highlight in one color the things that you're pretty sure you just don't need. You know, you're too small of a company. It just doesn't fit your industry. You don't really need that technology. You might just know that right off the bat. And then in another color, highlight those technologies that you already have but perhaps they're not really doing the job for you, or you wish that it was they were doing a little bit better. And then the next one is, hey, these are the technologies we have, and don't anybody touch them. They're doing great for us. We really got to make sure that you know, nothing happens to these. They're working, firing on all cylinders. And then the last one is those things that you need. So there's a lot of red here. Now what do you do with all of that? Well, this is where the pyramid comes in because we want you to prioritize. And as you see, sell more and again, there, in this example, there were three things that you felt, you felt that were needed, right? On the who to sell to and why, there were three things. So now what do you do? Well, who to sell to and why is the most important. That's the highest priority. So our recommendation would be to sell to start there. And if you can, if you can do all of them at once, that's great. But we would start there and solve that first problem first. And then instead of doing the who to sell to, or selling to more, selling more, or sorry, which one was it? Sell more and again. Um, you might notice that there was one need down here on the next second level. You might also want to address that one because that's the next level up in terms of priority. So again, it's just a framework to think about the technology you already have how to prioritize what needs to get solved, but it's very much a technology-driven approach. So the next thing we want to do is look at the capabilities. Oh, by the way, this one is one that everyone's quite interested in. I don't want to forget this one. Um, we have done a number of assessments, over 1,000. Okay. And now you are in Silicon Valley, right? You're, you're going to be much more ahead of most of the country perhaps the world, on where you're at in ter terms of maturity. Think about what the typical maturity might be, because I'm going to show you in two seconds. So if you're selling sales technology, 
you know, you've got to realize that people that are out there aren't as sophisticated. They don't know as much as you do. Um, if you probably in this room already are further to the right. But what I hear a lot is that people say, uh, I feel like, you know, there's so much technology out and we're just not taking advantage of it and we're behind. So what this says is you probably aren't behind. But the other thing it says is you should do something now because now is when it'll be a competitive differentiator. It won't be when everybody moves to the right. All right. So how do you prioritize the technology? Uh, we did a research study on uh, the use and purchase and, and anticipated purchase of technology. And what we found is there were four pillars, four solutions that a majority of the respondents said that they had and valued. And that's what they are. It's e-signatures had 42% of the respondents said, hey, we, got, we use e-signatures. 76% said they use CRM, no surprise there. Maybe a surprise that another 24% aren't using CRM. 68% uh, online meetings, no surprise there. And then the lead list building. So that makes sense and it matches up to, to um, the belt levels. Right? So if you don't have one of these, um, that might be kind of a no-brainer to think about. It might not be depending on your company, but this, you wouldn't be uh, wrong to think, well, maybe we should want to start with these four. And they didn't, they're not favorites by a small amount either. We asked about 26 different technologies. And as you can see on the, on the left, a significant difference in the use. So when I showed you, in, for any VCs and investment companies out here, um, when I showed you those 600 solutions, um, and you see that four are being used and the rest not as much, that tells you there's a lot of room for market growth here. Just, just so that you know on the marketing side, that technology landscape has close to 7,000, 7,000 uh, tools on it, technology types, companies, logos. Ours has 600, so that's one-tenth of the size. It's going to be growing tremendously, and there's a lot of acquisitions and investments already taking place. It's only going to get worse. It's only going to get harder. Um, all right, so the third thing is to audit your capabilities, and I, I made reference to that. So how do you go about doing that? Well, I have put some ideas down here <clears throat> for you to look at. So when it comes to who to sell to and why, you can ask yourself, can we identify our total available market? I can't tell. I remember a time when I started new at a company, and the first thing I did was I wrote down all the companies I could be selling to and the ones that aren't buying yet and should be and the ones that are buying but should be buying more. And my manager said, God, that was really great. Can you show the rest of the team how you did that? And I, I just remember being shocked, right? It's like, well, one, why, is it, why does this seem to be unusual? And two, why am I doing it? I should be spending my time selling. So you might want to think about you know, taking this off your hands for your reps. And that, that might be where marketing ops comes in. But identifying what's the total available market. That will also help you with your forecasting. Um, and then also not just depending on leads. Well, I want to know what my ICP is. Who's my ideal customer profile? Of all these 4,000 leads I just brought back from the trade show, which ones fit that? How should I prioritize? You don't want your sales reps to just go off and start calling from A to Z, these 4,000 people. It's not a good use of sales capacity. So you can ask yourself these questions. Can I identify total available market? Can I prioritize selling effort? Can I target all decision influencers? And you can add to this list. There's, there's a lot more. We have about 140 different capabilities that we've identified. How to engage and when. Can I build interest and momentum? Can I get prospects to engage? And that means, can, will they open my emails? Will they accept my phone calls? Can I know what works and why? Uh, so again, those are just questions, capability gaps. Why buying from you? Can I align the buyer's needs with our solutions? Or am I just pitching products? Do I know how to do that? Do my reps have ready access to information that will help them understand what this particular buyer might need? 
versus another particular buyer. That's big on the sales enablement side. Matching up content that's going to be relevant for that particular buyer based on their industry, company size, et cetera. How to close. Um, can I identify referrals? Uh, when I was carrying a bag, it'd be like, hey, Mike, do you, do you have anybody that my customer can talk to? And if you have and you're selling a product, maybe it's a high-end complex product, it's got a long sales cycle, people don't want to make a decision easily, they're, they're a little nervous about it, referrals can be very important. Are you making that easy for your salesperson to get? Are you able to generate contracts that you know aren't going to bounce back because you did the pricing wrong or you missed the configuration or you didn't do the terms right? Sell more and again, can you nurture those customers? This is, custo this is why customer success has grown so big as a market. And I don't, it'd be interesting to see in the room how many of you have your customer success team in charge of renewals. So they actually have a sales role. Okay, so that's, that's new. I mean, that's relatively new to do that. And that's why it's the self-actualization. It's really important. It's a lot easier and a lot cost effect, more cost effective to sell to an existing customer. And they're more likely to buy new products as well, research shows. So this is, again, a framework. You can start to highlight the things that are your big capability gaps. And then once you do that, then you can compare it to your technology exercise that you did. Can you auto roll up the forecast? A lot of people think, well, I just need my CRM and it does my forecast for me. Uh, but all of you in the room probably know that that's not really true. I mean, it does, but it doesn't give you a lot of information. It doesn't tell you, hey, X number of deals fell off the forecast or changed stage, went backwards, or have been changing stage back and forth. That's really important information to know so that you can know how to refine your whole sales process. And then learning, um, you know, reinforcement. There's a lot of great tools now that will help you onboard a sales rep a lot faster. Uh, if, you're, if it takes, on average, six months, which is not unusual, to onboard a new sales rep to revenue to their first deal, you multiply that times a lot of reps, that has a significant impact on your revenue. And you want, it's not enough to just meet one time in person once a year and do role play and exercise. So there's great role play technologies now in the marketplace. There's technologies you can do on your iPhone. So while you're in line at Starbucks, you get served up a couple questions. And if you don't answer them right, you've got access to the information that can help you with those. And then you reserve that question later if because you didn't get it right the first time. So another way to, to help you with that, can I, can my sales team learn within their normal workflow. If they're forecasting something, can I serve up some information that's going to help them with that? Or the opportunity stage just changed to, uh, you know, to, to a proposal? Are they, is there something I could be helping them with and, and training them on that's going to help them convert? So again, you can highlight the ones that you think match up. And then you want to compare the two. This is where it gets interesting. So I, I can put everything on one slide, but um, this is something you can either build yourselves or we can work with you because we have all of this. But as you can see on the left, I've, I've sort of taken the technologies off of that maturity model and listed them across the bottom. And then if you highlight and show where your highlights are, you can say, do these jive? These are the ones that I, I say I need or the ones that I say I have. And these are yet, these are the capability gaps that I said I had. So how is it jiving together? So that's just one way to, to do that. So the last thing is to know what questions to ask yourselves and your vendors. And I would suggest that you create a list with all those stakeholders that I brought up and mentioned at the very beginning. Create a list with, with them. Let's say that you have a project and you want to go out and look for a certain technology. These are the kind of questions that you want to ask yourself before you even go and talk to vendors. What are the people and processes necessary to extract value out of that? So one of the problems with the SaaS industry, we think we've kind of been trained, hey, it's a license, it's a permit license. We don't have to build anything. We just turn, us, turn it on and we go, right? It's good. It's SaaS. But that's not the case. Um, you have to still be able to extract value out of it. And oftentimes, that means you have to feed the tool. You have to give it the content that is needed. 
or you have to set up the workflows and the processes the right way. Who's going to do that? So those are, that's one good question to ask and to ask everyone in the room that's part of the stakeholder uh, team. Right? Uh, will we need he incremental headcount? That might impact whether or not you want to go that route. Maybe there's a different way you can solve the problem. If you need additional headcount, at least though that you'll know that you need to factor that in. You know, $50 license per sales rep seems like a lot, seems like it really adds up, but it's nothing compared to the proper utilization of a sales rep and also the other expenses that can go along with supporting that salesperson. Uh, there are implementation questions that you might want to ask. You know, what kind of initial and ongoing training are we going to need? Who's going to do that? Um, how are we going to roll it out? How, who, who are we going to train first? What are the business objections this solution is going to solve for us? And these are just hard questions to really ask yourself. It's, this gets back to the shiny object syndrome. It's real tempting to say, oh my god, I saw that at the trade show. And we can get our reps sending out you know, massive campaign emails to all of our clients. And so you just want to get it done because you think it's going to impact sales. And it probably will a little bit. But in the end, um, it could, could not be ideal. So these are the things that you really want to uh, ask yourself. Ongoing cost to support. Uh, what's the business problem we're trying to solve? How much of the solution will we use? That's a good one because a lot of times, you know, I mentioned all these point solutions, 600. Some are point solutions, some are platforms. But we think, well, we really need a platform. And that's what the vendor will tell you, too. You need a platform. They're just a point solution. So make sure you get a platform. And then you realize, I, I don't need that other part. Or we're not going to use it for another two years. And by then, we'll outgrown the system we're on. So we, don't, we can go with the cheaper one, the less expensive one, the one that just does the thing we need it to do right now. All right, and then questions to ask vendors. You know, it's easy to uh, start to, oftentimes what we do is we just go and we build up a feature function list and we, we start to compare. I get asked that all the time. Do you have, you know, comparison of this vendor versus that vendor? And I don't and I, I won't uh, put that together, although, you know, it's useful. I give you that. It is useful. But it's not the only thing and neither is price, as I mentioned earlier. You really want to talk to them and get a feel for, uh, what makes their customers successful versus the ones that haven't been as successful? What are some best practices that you should do as a potential prospect when you're rolling out their solution? So, you know, really dive in and, and think about what's life going to look like in the first 30 days, in the second 30 days. Have them tell you that. Have them tell you what questions you should be asking. That's a good one. I always like to do that. And you know, if you have a good rep, they'll tell you some of these. If you don't have a good rep, they'll say, well, does it have this function? Does it have this feature? And that might be a good indicator to say, maybe we should go a different route. All right, so in summary, the tech space is really crowded. It's confusing. You're not alone if you're wondering how to make sense of it all. Um, there is a way to figure it out. Right? You want to take a look at you know, what your current situation is and your capability gaps. Really think about what role you're going to play from a sales out perspective. Could you be the one that says we're going to raise our hands and we're going to suggest that we own this, that we own this process? Um, or should it be somebody else? Should it be somebody that oversees all of it? That's a question every company has to kind of struggle with and think through. And then uh, keep the four drivers in mind as you're looking at things. Is this really going to help us sell more? How is it going to help us sell more? Is it going to really help us do it in less time? Is it going to add to the time? Add to the time. By the way, CRM, just random thought here, CRM is not a productivity tool. It's actually an anti-productivity tool. <laughs> And the reason is because it takes up more time than it gives the rep back. It's not to say it's not useful and it's not important. You need it, for sure. But don't think, well, I got this, so now we have a productivity tool for sales reps. I encourage you to look at, someone mentioned it on the panel, look over their shoulder, spend a day a week watching the reps and how they engage and interact with CRM. 
and you'll find real fast why they're not using it and why you're not getting the data that you need and you're not getting the ROI back from the CRM. Uh, it's, it's not that sales reps are lazy or that they um, you know, want to hold all the information to their chest. Uh, it's that they don't feel they're getting enough from it. If I, if I stop and I put this information in, what's that going to give me back? So yet that has to be worth it to them. You have to make that a value. No sales rep ever said, I don't want the cell, cell phone. I don't need this. Why do I need this? Because it's a value to them. And that's ideally what we should get to with CRM or any sales tools. And the last thing is just to you know, take advantage of this stack framework to think through all of the ways that you should be thinking about technology. That's it. Should we take questions? Sure. Can you share some of your skills to learn what works for you uh, to close a sales fast, whether it's a phone call, a description, or email? Okay, so that's in, like tips and tricks when I was selling. It was a whole different world, a whole different world. I, I ask myself now, would I be success, as successful today as I was then? Um, but there are some things that don't change. So the skills, I'd say, um, really listen to your customer. Show them that you are, are listening. I can't tell you how many situations, sales calls, presentation. I hear a lot of presentations from reps on sales technology. And I'll, answer, I'll ask a question, and they answer something different, because that's what they're comfortable answering. And as a prospect, you just go, oh, this person doesn't even care about me. So even if you want to tell them something, acknowledge what they're asking first. Uh, I mean, it's, it's basics. Um, so I wish I had something really exciting and different secret sauce to tell you, but I think it just comes down to the basic. Care about your customer. Listen to your customer. Work as a team back at the office. Get everybody involved that needs to be involved. Uh, follow through. Follow through is really difficult these days, especially if even if with a large account, how are you going to plan your account strategy on a spreadsheet today? You, you really can't. And if you've got a team of people that are involved working and helping with that account, you have to have something that's shared within a document. Everyone has a plan. They're working towards that plan. I never had, I never had that. I was, I was hired and thrown into a quarter of a million dollar renewal and went by myself like the second week. It's like that. <laughs> um, so, these are the things to just cover the basics. Um, I haven't had this experience personally, but some of my friends in, in sales ops have complained about having more tools than they have reps. Yeah. And I think kind of from their perspective, they just, they had too many solutions. And I was kind of wondering your perspective on that. How do you know when you're spending too much on tools? Well, that's the problem with the fact that no, no one person or group is in charge. It's, a, pro, it's a, a result of the shiny object syndrome and the fact that there's so many technologies. It's not unusual. But by the way, the average number of sales tools being used is 4.6. Um, now, there's still a lot of companies that are using 20 and doing it successfully. Some are doing it successfully right down the road, um, the Sacramento Kings, um, East of the road. I'm in Sacramento, so to me it's right down the road. Uh, the Sacramento Kings, they let their sales reps experiment. So if you have a culture and you say, hey, we want you to find tools that you're going to like and use, and you make that part of the culture, then all of a sudden they're using them. And not only that, but they're, the, their sales buddy is saying, hey, how did you do that? And so then you have this just different mindset about tools. And it's OK if some people use these tools and other people like to use these tools. Everybody works differently. So, so that's another takeaway, I would say, is um, yes, it's not good to have a whole bunch of tools, but keep in mind that everyone works a little bit differently, and so there will be a number of tools as a result of that. Thank you very much.